Hello everyone, my name is Caitlin Dion. I am the Assistant Archivist at Keene State College in New Hampshire, United States. We're talking about the need for access and privacy with the Holocaust and Genocide Studies Collection and the Orang Osley Archive. Mm -hmm. Keene State College is a public liberal arts college located in Keene, New Hampshire, United States. Undergraduate programs include anthropology, criminal justice, education, film studies, nursing, and several others. Keene State also recently became the first accredited university in the United States to offer a Holocaust and Genocide Studies undergraduate degree. As a public institution, we have an obligation to provide access to students and researchers as much as possible, either in person or pro providing digital access. The Mason Library at Keene State College is home to the archive and special collections. The College Archive collects and preserves the records of Keene State College throughout its history and includes photographs, records, memorabilia, and school public publications. The special collections consist of materials with historical or cultural significance, as well as materials with scholarly, scholarly importance that enriches and supports the college curriculum and research. The special collection houses materials relating to local figures in the fight for social justice, New Hampshire poet laureates, and also houses the Orang Osley Archive and the Holocaust and Genocide Studies collections. The archive team at Keene State actively facilitates sessions in which visiting classes are able to work directly with the archival material. These class sessions are held in conjunction with the Holocaust and Genocide Studies program, as well as other classes looking to learn about primary source literacy, general history, using our archival materials. In addition to working with students, Keene State also hosts visiting researchers from around the world that work directly with our collections. Digitization of the archival collections is a vital part in enabling independent researchers and academic institutions to access our collections without having to travel to view the materials. It also promotes independent study of our students who are now able to access some of our collections digitally without making an appointment to see the archive in person. However, the unique nature of some of these collections pose a challenge to our mission of free and open access to our collections. The Holocaust and Genocide Studies collection consists of documents, photographs, and artifacts relating to World War II and the Holocaust. This collection is frequently used by students in the Holocaust and Genocide Studies program and are available for the public to access. While we at Keene State strive to make these items as accessible as possible, there is debate in the wider field of archives as to whether or not it is ethical to post Holocaust imagery online. The Orang Osley Archive at Keene State College is a collection of anthropo anthropological field notes, photographs, and artifacts about the Orang Osley people of Peninsular Malaysia. Some of the materials contain medical information, which we don't make available. Several anthropologists have contributed to the Orang Osley Archive, and it is utilized by institutions around the world. Digital access to photographs and other materials in this collection also allow the Orang Osley people themselves to view their own history. This archive allows individuals to research this little known indigenous population. Hello, my name is Kylie Isle and I have a degree in Holocaust and Genocide Studies. I'm currently a master's student at Keene State College and I focus on the Holocaust collection at the Keene State College archives. The Keene State College archives hold a vast collection of artifacts dedicated to the Holocaust. These artifacts include original photos, documents, and German memorabilia donated to the school for educational use. Currently, the Keene State College Archives allows anyone to enter the archive by appointment with the archivist. The Holocaust collection is available for the public to view without limitations on what they can see and handle. The Holocaust collection is also used for student purposes and is able to be handled by students for educational research. Small parts of the collection are available on the college's archive website for public viewing. The uploaded collection currently does not contain any photos depicting mass violence or German memorabilia, but do depict the effects of war, Jewish passports, personal letters, and family photos. When it comes to the digitization of Holocaust materials, there are multiple concerns regarding how the information is viewed and used. A major question remains to be answered. Should archivists draw a line on what should it and what should not be digitized and able to view for the public? Some of the debate around this has to do with the ethics and whether or not the displaying of all Holocaust imagery further dehumanizes and exploits its subjects. In an article from 2020, Paul Morrow discusses exactly this. He argues that these photographs 
emphasize our common humanity. However, he also says that it's up to institutions that teach about the Holocaust to use historical photog photographs appropriately, rather than merely using them to fill out exhibits. The article also states, some critics claim that any photograph staged or shot by perpetrators cannot be viewed without further de dehumanizing the subject. Continuing the argument, in 2009, Germany's constitutional court upheld a lower court's ruling that animal rights activists could not use Holocaust photographs in a visual campaign against animal cruelty. The case against the activists turned largely on the claim that displaying such photos in this context would violate the dignity of their subjects. The availability of digitization gives to the public of Holocaust archives can cause photos to be misused and abused for other purposes. On the other hand, Yad Vashem, a museum focused on the Holocaust located in Israel, strives to provide the public with access from afar to its documentation of collections. The process of digitization and scanning helps preserve the documentation by reducing the need for direct contact with the materials at the same time serving as backup. It is important to note Yad Vashem works to digitize all their archives. To date, all audio and video testimonies at Yad Vashem, every page of testimony, the entire photo archive, and half the microfilms have been scanned. The mission of Yad Vashem is to provide the public with as, with as much access as possible to digital archives. Not only does this project, um, project protect the original archive, but it provides access to people not just in Israel, but around the world. To gain community perspective on this question, Six people were interviewed about the Holocaust collection and how they felt about digitization of the Holocaust collection at Keene State College. Interviewees were asked a set of questions before they viewed the Holocaust collection. They were then given an unlimited amount of time to look at the collection thoroughly. After the interview, interview finished reviewing the collection, they were asked the same questions to see if their answers or ideas have changed. Two interviewees were Jewish. One, a son of surviving parents of the Holocaust. The other had no familial connections to the Holocaust. Four of the interviewees are students at Keene State College. Each student has a different major, is not Jewish, and has no familial connections to the Holocaust. Today, I will be presenting two of those interviews. The following questions were asked during the interview. Number one, how do you feel about digital access to archives? Number two, should the Dachau liberation photos be digitized and available online for public use or viewing? Number three, should ethnographic cultural practice be digitized and available for public use or viewing? Number four, where should the line be drawn when it comes to deciding what should be digitized and made available for public use or viewing? Number five, do you believe everyone should have online access to the Holocaust collection at Keene State College? And the final question, number six, what parts of the Holocaust collection should be shown? What parts of the collection should not be shown? Or should everything be shown in the collection? Roy Ginsberg, the son of Holocaust survivors, had a majority of answers in favor of digitization of the collection. Before and after viewing the collection, Ginsberg stuck with his answers stating, I feel good about digitization, and the more publicity, the better. He believes, as long as the information is valid, that it should be open to the public and digitized. The only concern Gidsberg had was the audience being shown the archives stating, maybe elementary school children would be too traumatized to some of the photos. He continues to state, but I've seen this since perhaps middle school or Sunday school. It's just reality. Everyone should know about it, not only for Jewish people, but for whenever humans dehumanize people, this is what could happen. Julia Martins, a student at Keene State College with no relation to the Holocaust, had a different approach to the questions. Martin believes digitization is important, especially if you're doing a research project or something, just to have that available for you. She believes if the person in the photo can be contacted, then they should have to give consent for the photo to be used. Martin states, if you have the contact information of the person that is in the photo, they can be contacted beforehand. If they're still living, and you have a contact with them, see if you can get permission or consent from them before doing it. She then goes on to state something that I believe is really important for archivists and historians to remember. She states, these are actual people. Where is their line of what they want to be shown and what they do not want to be shown? 
After viewing the collection, Martins believes the line should be drawn at the photos since consent has not been given. A major concern of digitization of the Holocaust collection is the misuse of digitized photos depicting mass atrocity, mass casualty, mass ex extermination, and war. There is, of course, risk in posting these photographs online. While we may not be able to control what others do with these images, we can control what we put online and how it's presented. Digital access to the Holocaust collection is vital, as 6.1 million European Jews were murdered at the hands of the Nazis. Having access to these archives gives students the opportunity to fully immerse themselves in the history. Posting disclaimers before being able to enter a page with graphic photos or documentation of Holocaust archives could be a beneficial way to provide the public with sensitive material. This can help viewers make the decision to exit the page if the material is too sensitive for their viewing. Keene State College strives to protect its students, its staff, and outside viewers from material that may be triggering to some. By creating warning messages, the college is able to digitize and upload the entire collection that is more accessible and safer for, you, for viewers who are interested in the Holocaust. Hi, I'm Mary Mahar. I'm an undergraduate student uh, studying secondary education and history at Keene State College. The Orang Asli are an indigenous peoples located in peninsular Malaysia. They make up only a fraction of the population, but have an extensive history. The Orang Asli have a total of 18 subgroups, accounting for just 0.5% of the population of Malaysia, equaling just under 200,000 people. The first known record of the Orang Asli goes back as far as 63,000 years ago. Throughout their history, a collection of artifacts and field notes has been a staple to understanding their cultural practices. Existing literature of the Orang Asli peoples have shown a great appreciation in conserving and preserving the evidence found about their people through archives, especially ones online. Most collections on the Orang Asli are found internationally rather than in Malaysia. As with other indigenous populations, the role of the Orang Asli in Malaysia at, is at times overlooked or misunderstood. And it bears noting, however, that the economic and political role of the Orang Asli in pre-colonial Malaya was crucial in the formation of the early peninsular states. This being said, throughout my time working at the Keene State Archives, I have had the privilege of preserving field notes and journals from Dr. Rosemary Giano, as well as Dr. Suichi Nagata, who both focus on peninsular Malaysian anthropology. Literature on the Orang Asli began back in 1847 with James Logan's Journal of the Indian Archipelago and Eastern Asia, the first to print information on the Orang Asli. Uh, since then, new Malaysian universities were established, as well as new publications within the social sciences, some being under the leadership of Saeed Hussein Ali, which eventually led to a larger field of Aboriginal studies. The research continued into the 1970s with Dr. Kirk Endicott and Dr. Suichi Nagata in hopes it would inspire more research to be done by the Malay scholarly population. The research was composed of field notes and journals from their time in peninsular Malaysia, some of which can be found at Keene State College. Dr. Rosemary Giano is an anthropologist specializing in Malaysian cultures. She earned her bachelor's degree at Queens College in New York City and her master's and PhD in philosophy in, at Yale University. She spent over four years in Malaysia and focused her fieldwork in Tasik Bera, studying the Orang Asli culture. She was heavily involved in the founding of the Orang Asli Archive at Keene State College and has been actively involved in its growth. Her collection is composed of various field notes, photographs, and audiovisual recordings she compiled during her time in Malaysia. During the interview I conducted with Dr. Giano, I asked her questions that pertain to the importance of preserving artifacts and field notes within the Orang Asli collection. I asked what her opinion is about the use of online public archives. She mentioned the importance of photographs, field notes, and transcripts because there's an issue about language because there's a lot of different languages. In Malaysia, there are over 130 different languages that are still spoken today, and over 40 of them are in peninsular Malaysia where the Orang Asli live. Dr. Giano also spoke about the importance of preserving the court cases over land issues in Malaysia because it was felt that all of these field notes and records and artifacts weren't safe in Malaysia. Dr. Giano goes on to state that she believes that the 
government is very concerned about trying to take land from the indigenous people, the Irama Asli, so they're not motivated to preserve and retain a lot of these materials. Malaysian law reaffirms the role of state authorities in matters relating to land, giving them supreme powers to gazette and to revoke land belonging to the Irama Asli, while Malay land is constitutionally protected. It should be noted, however, that other Malaysian laws do grant the Orang Asli certain privileges, including the marriage and divorce of Aborigines to be governed by native customary law, permission to shoot, kill, or take protected wild animals and birds for the purpose of providing food for himself or his family, and are exempted from holding licenses for the removal of forest produce from certain classes of land. Given the tumultuous nature of indigenous rights, um, including property, preserving as much information and materials as possible is vital. Dr. Giano emphasized how using an online archive is so important for these people because they will be able to have access to it, even though those artifacts and documents are across the world. When asked about access to digital archives, Dr. Giano had similar responses to those we asked about the Holocaust collection. She mentioned, you want to screen the people who are going to be using the archive. So if somebody's going to be using it, you want to make sure they have good reason for using it. And if they have a record of studying Aram Asli or something that is relevant to the Aram Asli cultures, then you can have to trust them that they aren't going to abuse the information. The use of online public archives creates a dilemma of what to display and what should not be displayed online. Within the Aram Asli archive, the ethnographic content can be seen as a concern for some. Dr. Giano discussed one issue with the Orang Asli is that a lot of the pictures from the 19th or 20th century, people have very little clothing on, and there's a lot of people who feel that those kinds of pictures should be sequestered or not as available, and I think that's a two-edged sword. In addition to images containing nudity, there are some that depict customs of the Orang Asli, such as ritual circumcision, that may not be understood by Western viewers. In the field of anthropology, it is key to understand various cultures around the world and how their different cultural practices are used in their daily lives. Dr. Giano emphasizes the importance of not looking down upon those who experience the world differently from us just because it does not fall under our societal norms. In addition to being used by researchers, the online archive can also be accessed by the Orang Asli themselves. The Facebook group Gambar Samalai Juman will occasionally have photos from the archive shared to it. There are currently just over 1,500 members in this group and has been growing since March of 2020. Dr. Giano created the Facebook group when the COVID-19 lockdowns began so she could continue to connect with the Orang Asli without physically being there. She uploaded a couple of photos every day from her time in Malaysia, creating her own interactive archive online. The Orang Asli are very active in the group and enjoy seeing their lives in a way that can be used as an educational tool. The digitization of the Orang Asli archive provides access to materials that would not otherwise be accessible to many around the world. It is a crucial to both researchers and to the Orang Asli people themselves that we continue in our mission to provide access to as much of the materials as possible. <clears throat> the Holocaust and Genocide Studies collections and the Orang Asli Archive have a prominent place in the archive and pose the most challenges in regards to ethics. The Keene State College Archive also contains material that may have been restricted by the donors themselves or are under copyright. Like the Holocaust and Genocide Studies collections and the Orang Asli Archive, some of these materials are open to the public and are in the process of being digitized when we are able to do so and allowed to do so. While we as archivists work with this material on a regular basis, it is vitally important to not lose sight of the human element of archives. Archive, archivists are the keepers of the items, but may not, should not necessarily be the gatekeepers of knowledge, deciding which items can be viewed. Instead, we should be the guardians preserving the materials so that the future generations can continue to learn from and work with the past. Digitizing materials, especially those of high historical or cultural significance, can help to provide access while maintaining the integrity of an item that may otherwise become too fragile to handle. The challenge is to do so respectfully and properly. Thank you. Thank you.